Uh, thank you for coming. This is as terrific an audience as I have seen in one room in Washington in many years for an education conversation. We're flattered and honored that you're here. Uh, we're aware that a few of you um, missed the two terrific panels and Saul Stern's brilliant talk this morning, as well as the incredible video tribute to Don Hirsch. Um, but we are glad you are here for lunch and to listen to the real Don Hirsch, as opposed to just uh, seeing him on the screen. Though it's well worth your uh, revisiting that video when you get the opportunity. Uh, it's a great honor to uh, introduce him as our keynote speaker at the midpoint in this day. Uh, afterwards, incidentally, the after lunch panel is going to stay in this room rather than go back into the auditorium. Um, I, I, I discovered in the course of the morning that the people who are renovating the building must have run out of money because behind that stage curtain, there is no stage. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and for fear of falling off the stage we've, and making you all move again, we've just decided to do the after lunch conversation uh, right here so you don't have to move again. Um, the, those of you that saw the video heard a little bit of the, of the history here that I'm going to very briefly recount. Uh, once upon a time, in 1981, before a nation at risk, uh, uh, my friend and former colleague Diane Ravitch and I organized a loose confederation called the Educational Excellence Network. And we had this sense that something was not right in American education, and the, the Excellence Commission hadn't yet reported a nation at risk. And, uh, um, we got some people together and said, let's have a conference. Uh, we did it under the guise of uh, what was wrong with the humanities in American K-12 education, in part because uh, uh, Bill Bennett, then chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, was willing to pay for a couple of conferences on the topic of what was wrong with the humanities in American education. So we started looking around for speakers for these conferences on the humanities. Um, and uh, we came upon this um, article by this guy we never heard of before uh, called E.D. Hearst, Jr., and it was in this uh, scholarly publication called The American Scholar. Uh, and uh, we said, that's really interesting, uh, what he's writing. Uh, let's see if he could come to the conference and talk. And, uh, uh, and, and, and lo and behold, he did. Um, he gave a wonderful talk, uh, now incorporated in one of the least read books in all of America, called Challenges to the Humanities, which is the collection of papers out of that conference uh, in the early 1980s. Um, and um, he gave a talk there that, is, uh, that, that, that was called The Problem of Educational Formalism. Um, and in it, he briefly recaptured what he had written in The American Scholar and then went beyond it. Um, and um, I'm going to read you just a couple sentences from the, um, the, the part of the intro that Diane and I wrote to the book that was about Don's talk, because uh, I think it's actually worth, worth repeating. Um, this goes back to uh, uh, now almost 30 years. Um, the uh, developing insights he first presented in a pair of seminal essays in The American Scholar, Hirsch wrestles with the challenge posed by educational formalism, namely the assumption that literacy is content free and can be taught as a set of technical skills. He demonstrates that this view, widely popular within the education profession and in many academic circles as well, is fundamentally unsound and that even so seemingly simple a task as reading a newspaper article with understanding becomes virtually impossible if the reader has not previously absorbed a substantial amount of specific knowledge and made at least the casual acquaintance of a great deal more. Um, this is, as I say, 30 years ago. We are still um, rediscovering this point. Uh, we have a moment uh, in time to rediscover it further uh, as the um, Common Core standards um, get implemented, uh, so far mostly badly, uh, in American uh, states and districts. Um, and we have the opportunity to, um, to, to hear Don himself. I brought with me my original copy of Cultural Literacy, uh, inscribed by E.D. Hirsch in the uh, late 1980s. This was a product in part of, of, of Diane and myself imploring him to take what he had written as articles and turn them into a book. 
This volume comes complete with 75 pages of list at the end. Uh, as we heard earlier, some people never went beyond or rather back, back in front of um, the list to understand why the knowledge mattered that was being listed in great detail. It's a wonderful list, by the way. Uh, it's actually well worth your revisiting. Um, and it came out in 1987, um, along with uh, Alan Bloom's book on the closing of the American mind, same year, and a uh, little bit of, of self-puffery uh, here. Diane's in my book called What Do Our 17-Year-Olds Know? Uh, based on a national assessment of history and English that um, demonstrated fairly conclusively that our 17-year-olds knew damn little. Uh, and uh, as, as if creating a kind of, um, kind of factual underpinning that went beyond uh, Don's experience at the community college in Richmond and beyond a lot of other um, um, previous indicators to say that our kids are at the, nearing the end of high school, don't know squat. Um, and uh, Don offered a solution to that problem. Uh, and um, he's been I've, a friend for all these 30 plus years. I've been an admirer, recently joined the Core Knowledge Foundation board myself. Um, I don't like to join boards anymore these days, but this one's important. Uh, and uh, uh, we are delighted that uh, Don has ventured out of his lair in Charlottesville uh, to join us today for a day that is not just a tribute to him personally, uh, but I think the, the, the key part of today uh, in Washington, D.C. in uh, 2000, at the end of 2013 um, is how do we take these insights and findings and opportunities um, and push them forward uh, over the next few years? Not just celebrate where we've come, um, but chart a course for where we need to go and how we're going to get there. Uh, without further ado, it's a great privilege and honor to uh, introduce uh, E.D. Hirsch, Jr., our friend Don. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you all for coming here uh, today. Uh, I want to thank uh, yeah, maybe just a, little bit. a little bit more. Uh, thanks to uh, you, Checker, and Saul, and Ma Manhattan, and Fordham for. Uh, sponsoring this, and I want to give special thanks to uh, uh, Valerie and Lewis, uh, whom you heard this morning, uh, who's been teaching core knowledge for 15 years at a public school in, in New York, and uh, Gerald Terrell, my old friend and past president of core knowledge, who was a core knowledge principal in the very early days. It's, you were very brave to undertake it, uh, both of you, and uh, many teachers and principals like you who have uh, given a lot of kids the romance and power of, of knowledge. I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, B.J. Steinbrook here from the uh, Challenge Foundation and uh, Holly Nuchterlein for helping uh, in a financial way, the, the giving us the possibility of, of putting some of these ideas into effect. And thanks to all of you. And, and thanks to the uh, movie maker, too. <laughs> I was, uh, over the years, it, it has not been, uh, as Checker pointed out, a lack of ideas which has held back the uh, core knowledge uh, movement. It's, it's the difficulty of uh, of changing ideas, uh, really. Uh, and added to that is uh, we, we've had, a, except for you, we, we happy few, as Prince Hal said, we, we have had a, a dearth of allies in, in the past and a great number of opponents. And, and I, one thing Checker didn't mention in his retrospective remarks was uh, that, and you pointed it out to me, that when cultural literacy came out, it was the subject of not one but two savage reviews in the teacher college uh, bulletin. And 
<laughs> as a, it was a kind of symbolic ritual. First the book had to be killed, and then its <laughs> body parts had to be eaten <laughs> to, to make really sure. Uh, and, and Saul has been a, a brave and eloquent supporter through thick and thin, and there are plenty of opponents still, but uh, recently they seem to have quieted down. And uh, thanks in great part to, to you allies. That's, uh, I, I should also say that's enormously gratifying to uh, an old uh, man like me, and I do mean old, uh, but you should uh, take heart. Uh, if you uh, live to be 85, you too may be <laughs> the subject of a special event in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, thanks to all of you who said nice things about me. Uh, my parents used to, uh, and their generation, used to quote uh, Kipling's If. Uh, they all knew it by heart. And it had two lines. If you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, uh, which is a good principle, but I have to say it's OK to show a momentary preference for uh, <laughs> triumph. <laughs> um, and also, you've attached my name to the core knowledge idea. Well, uh, I've been uneasy, as many of you know, with that. Uh, uh, the kind of guru principle of uh, where you, ta for example, the name Piaget is attached to a psychological principle. And that goes against the ethos of, of the sciences. And I've been trying, I have to say, to de Hirschize core knowledge for 30 years. And to some extent, today's panel, despite uh, an, an event, despite this marvelous tribute, has granted the point that there's a principle behind. It's not the Hirsch principle, and it's not the particular vertically aligned, as, uh, uh, as was termed. It's, it's the principle that is critical here. And anyone who supports that principle is an ally of core knowledge. And despite all the travails that were mentioned in, in the, the two excellent uh, panels this morning, I, I have confidence, certainly prob possibly misplaced, but confidence that the principle is going to prevail because uh, it corresponds uh, to reality, it corresponds to uh, the specific knowledge basis of human competence, which is something that uh, psychology is, get, is saying with an ever louder voice. Now, you all know what the, the central idea of core knowledge was, that it was a scientific finding that language comprehension requires a mountain of unseen unspoken uh, knowledge, a kind of dark energy uh, that governs uh, uh, verbal comprehension, and that the school's neglect of this uh, hidden knowledge uh, depressed language competence and its perpetuated inequality. And those aren't Hirsch-created ideas. But on this occasion, it's, uh, I, I want to reminisce briefly uh, about my, why my old age centered on that particular insight. And then I'll go to my main topic, which is uh, the teaching of civics. Checker pointed out that we go back a long way. I think we go back in this room uh, the longest of uh, any pair. And. Uh, like Al Shanker, uh, Checker had the uh, kind of mind that was persuaded by a cogent argument. And he and Diane, like Al, uh, latched on to the cultural literacy uh, argument right after the essay uh, by that name came out. And uh, let me just say that I, I could make a story out of how that uh, 
essay then led in some coherent way to something else. But, and you try to make a, a story out of the buzzing confusion. Uh, but the, uh, and in fact, there was a lot of buzzing confusion around that essay because it only got published because uh, the then editor, Joe Epstein, kept bugging me for uh, a year to bring it out after my pal Gerald Graff had heard me give a 20-minute talk at an MLA, a Modern Language Association meeting. But step back a little further, if I may reminisce, and you picture a, a college kid, my, me in college, who had the, whole, the, the soul of a, of a hard scientist, really, but was undisciplined and drifting. And at two critical decision points, I uh, moved into the field of literature and then into education. And I, nothing better epitomizes the uh, contradiction between uh, my hard science temperament and, and the soft metier that I found myself in than a letter I got after cultural literacy came out in 87. It was from a very distinguished literary friend of mine. It went like this. Dear Don, you quote Plato in your book saying, let us follow the argument whither it leads. But you don't want to do that if it's going to lead to a place where you know you don't want to go. Which to me encapsulates what C.P. Snow called uh, the difference between the two cultures the hard sciences, and a great deal of work in, in literature and in education where the answer is known before you start because you already know you're going to support a moral or a ascetic stance of some kind. I've uh, never liked that kind of thinking, and I remember as a kid I used to love to do the Lewis Carroll syllogisms. He had, a, I don't know whether you've ever seen them, but there were a, a bunch of absurd premises and you're to find the, the right conclusion by uh, following the logical train of, of these absurd premises. And I think Checker and Al Shanker too liked uh, logical thought. And uh, anyway, uh, I have to say, see Rick Collenberg is here, that uh, I was very moved one time when I was looking at Al Shanker's library, it's lodged in the AFT, and uh, I took out an unlikely book, which was Bosanquet's uh, Logic, and uh, saw his voluminous annotations to it. And now, let me mention one other little trait, I thought, besides liking to follow logical trains, and that was, I, looking backwards, I see an instinct to restore balance. Uh, in, in, I, the, my favorite course in teaching was the history of literary theory. And uh, in the 60s, uh, all of my students came in as little Aristotelians, or, or young Aristotelians. And th they all thought that uh, what made a, a literary work good was its formal excellence. And uh, I used to urge against that. I used to urge Plato's notion that a literary work is good if it's good for you and good for your society. And uh, then in the 80s, of course, and 70s, they all came in as little Platonists saying that uh, a work is good for you if it's, uh, if it's ideologically correct and socially beneficial. And I argued with them for Aristotle. And uh, I tried to, in the end, get their support for the the middle ground, the theorists who said, literary work is good if it's formally good and also good for you, like uh, Horace and Philip Sidney. And, and that balancing instinct is what I see going on in, in the scholarly work I did on romantics, on interpretation theory, and then finally on education. Uh, I thought that new criticism in, in literature and progressivism in education uh, shared the same overemphasis on the idea that students need how-to skills 
rather than a lot of relevant factual knowledge. Uh, the new critics disparaged historical and biographical facts and claimed that the how-to approach would uh, unlock literature as literature. Progressive education disparaged mere facts, claimed that what students needed was critical thinking skills, 20th century skills, later 21st century skills. And here I want to thank another ally. Uh, when I was writing Schools We Need in the 90s, which uh, went into those issues in more detail, and I think uh, on the whole is the best book I, I wrote on education. Uh, I was being tutored in cognitive psychology by a young psychology professor, Dan Willingham, and he's still tutoring me. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. So to sum up this brief effort to see some kind of autobiographical pattern leading to core knowledge, I would say I w was a dissenter not because I enjoyed courting controversy, uh, but because I thought there needed to be a counterbalance to traditions that had become uh, one-sided. But notice the difference between what happened to new criticism and what happened to progressivism. New criticism had to make its way in the rough and tumble of arts and sciences. It's no longer a dominant force in literary study. Progressivism is still safely enthroned in its domain. In arts and sciences, you can get a full professorship if you kill your fathers, your intellectual fathers. <laughs> you try father killing in an ed school and you'll be expelled by an, the intellectual monopoly, which, by the way, David Steiner bravely brought out, <laughs> whether to his regret or <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, anyway, the, I think the move, this orthodoxy, a movable orthodoxy that reigns in teacher training institutions is very bad news for the nation. And I think it's, and chiefly because those ideas are scientifically uh, wrong, and therefore yield poor results. In the long view, that system of ideas is the gravest problem in American education. Ideas determine practices, whether at whatever level you're talking about, whether the legislators, the superintendents, or the and so on, and the teachers. You, you can get the right ideas from science and from logic, but, uh, and you'll get, you, you may have very good policies, but they won't prevail uh, unless teachers and administrators change their ideas. I was very interested in Steve Farkas's uh, report on the possibility of, of such a change in uh, teacher attitudes. It would be marvelous if it could be affected. And some of you also mentioned in the panels this morning that the district preparations for Common Core are given, giving new names to district preparations for No Child Left Behind, and all of the other process uh, procedures that have gone on in the past under new names, but uh, with no systematic emphasis, as the panels pointed out, on imparting facts, which are still mere. One way uh, to counteract uh, that trend would be, and I've mentioned this before, and, and Robert Pondicio has mentioned it, is to, uh, to create curriculum-based uh, tests for early grades. Now, I, there may be some representatives of billionaires here, but if I were a billionaire, what I would do would, and, and I wasn't under the constraints that the, the test consortia are under right now, 
uh, I would uh, have such tests made. I, I would say, okay, these, these tests are curriculum-based, and they're based on this curriculum, and uh, you can use them or not use them. I'm giving them to you for free, but if you use them, your, uh, your, verbal, your, your student's verbal abilities will rise. And uh, somebody might use them, and then verbal abilities would rise. It would take some time. But, uh, and then that would change ideas, I think. But nothing short of a change of ideas is going to work. Uh, I, I was, before I heard uh, C. Farkas's uh, remarks, I was, say, I, I was saying in, in this uh, paper, we needed an army of core knowledge Billy Grahams uh, who were able to induce mass uh, conversion experiences all over the country. But maybe it won't be so hard, I don't know. Maybe, maybe less able conversion makers will do the trick, but I think a conversion of ideas is going to, uh, new ideas are going to be required. Now I want to turn to my main topic. Uh, I know it animates many of you who are in this room, and uh, that is the relation of schooling to the nation. I, I think that this, you could consider this topic another version of this rebalancing instinct because, as you know, the NAEP uh, data on, on civics knowledge is startling over, over the past 50 years, the decline of civic knowledge. And I, I mean, that's a data point that not even the defenders of the status quo uh, challenge. After the Second World War, uh, the United States, being by far the most powerful and influential nation in the world, uh, complacency about the United States reigned. Few emphasized the educational tradition that the schools are needed to help unify and sustain this artificially patched together nation. Along with this complacency, many became disillusioned with U.S. policies, militarism, Watergate, Vietnam. And all over the country, in humanities departments and schools of education, there developed an insistent criticism of the United States, particularly during the Vietnam period, when it seemed far more important to criticize than to praise and sustain. But to our earliest thinkers about education, Benjamin Rush, Noah Webster, the inherent fragility of what they termed the American experiment was present to their minds. This was to be, it was an experiment in two senses. This was the first large republic made out of republics. And it was also to be the first uh, nation made out of ideas instead of myths and, and traditions. Uh, Washington called it our empire. And uh, the stripes on the flag and the out of many one, that, that was the idea of uh, a nation of nations. And the idea that it sh was to be artificially created out of ideas was also a worrisome fact in, in the minds of these educational thinkers. Um, and it, it was interesting, in Washington's will, uh, there was a, a bequest to education with the explicit purpose of saying, this will help uh, give a more national or, or, or view of the country beyond uh, regional and factional uh, fragmentation. And Benjamin Rush in, in 1786 um, stated that the aim of American schools was to create Republican machines. He was being urbane. <laughs> uh, but he, what he meant was there was needed to be a common indoctrination in Enlightenment ideals with everyone 
taught to pull together. They understood that this deliberate kind of nation making was needed uh, in this new type of post-enlightenment nation. And a few decades later, given the stain of, of slavery and racism, the school ideal expanded to include what Randolph Bourne termed transnational America, a union not just of many states, <clears throat> but also of many ethnicities and, and races. And that was a, a quick change from the earliest days. You know, ben Benjamin Franklin Frank famously disliked having Germans in Pennsylvania uh, with their odd language and messing up the neat commonality of the Commonwealth with the, their newspapers. By the early 19th century, the ideal of the common school was becoming fully realized along with the ideal of the melting pot. Everybody, no matter what their color or national origin, were to be Americanized into feeling patriotic sentiment and sharing ideals of equality and democracy. I, I'll quote one brief speech from 1838. You, you may recognize it. Let it be breathed by every American mother to the lisping babe that prattles in her lap. Let it be taught in schools, in seminaries, and colleges. Let it be written in primers, spelling books, and almanacs. Let it be preached from the pulpit, proclaimed in legislative halls, and enforced in courts of justice. And in short, let it become the political religion of the nation. Let the old and the young, the rich and the poor, the grave and the gay of all sexes and tongues and colors and conditions unceasingly sacrifice upon its altars. It was Abraham Lincoln in 1838, he, age 28. Uh, and all were to be Americanized, not just the descendants of Great Britain. And that was the central theme of the common school in the, in the 19th century. As I found out uh, uh, by reading an 1848 history of the common school in New York State, uh, which was actually one of the most thrilling books I've ever read, uh, and I quoted at length in, in a, a book called the Make, uh, I wrote recently called The Making of Nations. And the making of American patriots be, it continued to be a self-conscious aim of the schools, as those of us who are my age well remember. Um, on well into the 1930s, uh, to our good fortune, the common school idea helped create the United States, helped sustain it as a national community and, and made the, what they called the experiment more or less a success. Now, let's turn to the present. A couple of months ago, I got a, a frantic, desperate email from my granddaughter, Cleo, who's a wonderful do-gooder. She just graduated from college and uh, she's teaching in a public school in the Bronx and she's teaching the American Revolution to seventh graders. She had no guidance from New York City about what she should teach these seventh graders, uh, or New York State, or from her own school. Uh, they, uh, she didn't know what she could assume they already knew. And uh, so I had some teacher handbooks from Core Knowledge sent to her, which were a help, but it didn't help her know what her students knew that she could build on. And uh, I, I put all of this in a blog and got a response from a New York teacher said, well, Cleo should go look at this website to find out what it is that her seventh graders knew. And so I did, and I, uh, I want to quote you what, what I found. There was nothing in sixth grade about American history, but in fifth grade in New York State, uh, you have the following content guide. Uh, it'll only take a minute to read. 
And I, I, I want you to note the, uh, the, uh, the uh, emphasis on the word different in this, in this little document. Different ethnic, national, and religious groups, including Native American Indians, have contributed to the cultural diversity of North American nations and regions by sharing their customs, traditions, beliefs, ideas, and languages. Different people living in the Western Hemisphere may view the same event or issue from different perspectives. The migration of groups of people in the United States, Canada, and Latin America has led to cultural diffusion because people carry their ideas and ways of life with them when they move from place to place. Key turning points and events in the histories of Canada, Latin America, and the United States can be organized into different historical periods. For example, key turning points might include 18th century exploration, 19th century westward migration, 20th century population movement. Important historical figures and groups have made significant contributions to the development of Canada, Latin America, and the United States. Industrial growth and development and urbanization have important impacts on Canada, Latin America, and the United States end of content guide. And uh, as you can see, it's quite unclear whether the emphasis should fall on Canada, Latin America, or the <laughs> United States. Uh, but the one thing that is clear uh, from these standards is an attitude. Let's not be nationalistic. Let's not place a narrow focus on the United States. That would be narrow. Let's learn unspecified things about the nations of two entire continents and the diversity. So in New York State, the cradle of the common school, uh, the one definite thing to be learned is a trans-patriotic attitude. Let's not assume the USA deserves more emphasis than its neighbors. New York is not unique in this kind of content guide. Uh, and I, th I would say that they are, the content guides like that are the residues of courses that are being promulgated in ed schools in foundations of education courses. And David Steiner may or may not, he's, he's looked at the, at the syllabi of those courses. But in any case, uh, they are focused on such things as the politics of difference, uh, multiculturalism, and so on. In, in my book, uh, The Making of Americans, I quoted my late dear friend, Richard Rorty, who made a distinction between my kind of left and uh, the old left, and exemplified by Dick himself and by Al Shanker, who was a deep patriot, contrasting with the academic left uh, of recent vintage, which was also dedicated to some, some of the same causes, like uh, uh, racial equality and uh, gender equality and so on, gay rights. But it was also affected, infected with vocabulary correctness, snobbish jargon, and anti-national attitudes. So in 94, uh, Dick Rorty wrote a memorable op-ed in the New York Times. It's, it's been forgotten by now. Everything gets forgotten <laughs> quickly now. But uh, it, it foresaw Cleo's problem with great prescience and, I, I, and, and eloquence. And I'll quote from it. Most of us still identify with our country. We take pride in being citizens of a self-invented, self-reforming, enduring constitutional democracy. We think of the United States as having glorious, if tarnished, national traditions. Many of the exceptions to this rule are found in academic departments that have become sanctuaries for left-wing political views. I'm glad there are such sanctuaries even though I wish we had a left more broadly based, less self-involved, less jargon-ridden than our present one. 
Their focus on marginalized groups will in the long run help make our country much more decent, tolerant, and civilized. But there is a problem with this left. It is unpatriotic. In the name of the politics of difference, it refuses to rejoice in the country it inhabits. It repudiates the idea of national identity and the emotion of national pride. The chairman of the National Endowment of the Humanities recently proposed town meetings to explore the meaning of American identity. It's important to insist, uh, and, and, by, and, and Dick goes on to say, this, uh, this was criticized as, quote, the gentlemanly face of nationalism and as supporting the evil of a shared national identity. And Dick goes on, it is important to insist that a sense of shared national identity is not an evil. It is an absolutely essential component of citizenship. If any, of any attempt to take our country and its problems seriously. There is no incompatibility between respect for cultural differences and American patriotism. A nation cannot reform itself unless it takes pride in itself, unless it has an identity, rejoices in it, reflects upon it, and tries to live up to it. Such pride sometimes takes the form of an arrogant, bellicose nationalism, but it often takes the form of a yearning to live up to the nation's professed ideals. If we fail in such identification, we fail in national hope. If we fail in national hope, we shall no longer even try to change our ways. If in the interests of ideological purity or out of the need to stay as angry as possible, Dick had a marvelous wit. Um, the academic left insists on a politics of difference. It will become increasingly isolated and ineffective. An unpatriotic left has never achieved anything. A left that refuses to take pride in its country will have no impact on that country's politics and will eventually become an object of contempt. Uh, Richard Rorty's uh, prophecy has, has proved true. Over the past three decades, the cultural left has dominated in our education schools in foundations of education courses. Teachers are trained to scorn traditional American boosterism, and which is a good thing to critique, but it's gone too far and caused a great deal of harm. Dick's brave piece, by the way, caused a lot of outrage among his colleagues, and, uh, but it made an important and subtle point that I think is critical for us uh, on left and right to keep in mind, and that is the difference between nationalism and patriotism. Uh, and it's a difference that's particularly American. Uh, before the American experiment, nations still had a connection with uh, the root of, of the word, which is natio, birth. The nation was where people were born, where they lived. Uh, it had a, a quasi-tribal uh, flavor to it. it was, uh, that was well summarized, by the way, in Fichte's uh, 1807 book called uh, Addresses to, to the German Nation, when he reassured, he reassured his fellow Germans that, who had just suffered a military defeat by Napoleon, uh, that German Teutons are, are really much better than French Gauls. American patriotism is inherently different. It's not based on birth, but on enlightenment ideas. If Americans do claim superiority, it's certainly not because they're descended from Teutons or even from Anglo-Saxons, but because they created a nation based on e equality, freedom, and, and toleration. A vigorous and successful United States could not have evolved if our schools had not deliberately sustained those ideals through national myths about courageous heroes who fought for those principles. So here we are with uh, Cleo's dilemma. What shall I teach my students? And granting 
all the positive things that have been accomplished uh, uh, by the cultural left. And let's also grant that we needn't look back to the 19th century uh, for guidance, uh, but need to look ahead. But I, I think it also would be useful to agree on a sort of practical rule. If we are going to uh, get rid of Columbus or some other uh, national hero, we, we ought to replace him or her with another who equally well promotes courage, democratic ideals, unity, national pride. Shared heroes and common ideals are absolutely needed for the schools of the United States, no less now than in the past. It's not necessary to tell lies to sustain heroes. There were heroes. Uh, and if you want to look for an example of how to do it, I <laughs> look at the core knowledge sequence, and you will find uh, a balance between loyalty to ideals and historical truth. But unfortunately, that's a rare example. Our teachers' priorities have been distorted for several decades by fashionable superficial theories, which claim moral superiority to a su supposedly evil nationalism. If I were asked, and I'm, I'll close with this, if I were asked what books teachers in training could usefully be exposed to, it would not be the uh, anti-national self-righteous ones uh, by uh, Freire and Macedo. It, uh, it would be the poetic musings of Benedict Anderson. I don't know if you're familiar with his book, Imagine Communities, but that phrase, that title, Imagine Communities, exactly defines uh, what the U.S. is, it's an imagined community, sustained and idealized by textbook makers and by the creators of the common school. In reading him, teachers would encounter an eloquent distinction between patriotism and nationalism. Nationalism defines one group over against others. It sees differences as inherent, which is also what Multiculturalism, unfortunately, does. It's nativist, uses terms that imply contamination and infiltration. The transnational patriotism, symbolized by the flag, uh, can accommodate all tribes within a larger conceptual loyalty learned in childhood. So let me sum up what the great patriots of the common school understood. Only an imagined community can embrace a country this big. The common school ideal doesn't need to look backwards, but it does need to be sustained. The themes of the Declaration hold in all centuries. As Lincoln insisted at the end of his pre-presidential address in Milwaukee, Patriotism, says Benedict Anderson, doesn't differ from other affections in which there is always an element of fond imagining. The affections learned in childhood are parted with only at the grave, pasts are restored, fellowships are imagined, and futures dreamed, end quote. The American experiment will cease to thrive when those imaginings and loyalties cease to be nurtured in our schools. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.